Well, this morning and last night, we talked about driving despair. And, you know, if we're, if we're not careful, despair can get a root in our hearts, and it can cause us to even cloud your thinking. And despair, if you're not careful, can cloud your emotions, can make you feel things, right? You know, you get into a situation, and, you know, if you feel bad, then you're with this group of people, and someone says something, and you feel bad, where normally you wouldn't if you didn't have despair. So despair has a way of kind of coloring and, and uh, controlling our sense of well-being and our sense of happiness. It can color, like I said, every situation that we find ourselves in. And, you know, we talked about this last week, but in Webster's, the definition of despair is loss of hope, hopelessness, right? And in the New Testament, it means to be utterly at a loss, to be destitute of measures or resources, to be in despair, to renounce all hope. So no resource. I think that's the number one thing the devil does when you're in despair. And think about it. This is what happens to people who end up committing suicide. They're in such despair, they think, I have no way out. There's no way this is going to change. I have no hope of a future here. And then they feel like my only recourse is to exit. My only recourse is to end my life and to exit. Well, we know that's the work of the enemy, right? God does not want us to be driven by despair. He wants us to drive it out of our lives. He doesn't want us to be overcome by it. And we shared this morning and actually last week too about Elijah. And remember how Elijah wanted to, God to do something spectacular to speak to him. And um, God, you know, sent a wind that broke rocks. That's a pretty significant wind, <laughs> I still can't get over that. I've never seen a wind break walks. Never. Have you? Have you ever seen winds break walks? Never seen winds break walks. So it was a very powerful wind in the earthquake, and he sent a fire. And God was not in any of that, but God was in the still, small voice. And it was in that small voice that God began to speak to Elijah, and he told him his next step. He literally gave him his succession plan. He says, I want you to anoint this king, this king, and I want you to anoint Elijah, who, of course, became his, men, his mentee, his little protege, that rose up, of course, to do double the miracles that Elijah did. Isn't that exciting? That what he imparted into somebody, and I think it was neat that it took three, two kings and a prophet to fulfill what Elijah was called to do. That's pretty amazing, to take over his job. It took two kings and a prophet. So... Praise God, but Elijah, one of the people that Elijah himself ministered to was he ministered to a Shunam, Shunamite, Shunamite, there we go, Shunamite woman. And now this woman, we're going to see how she had every opportunity. And I know you, many of you are very familiar with this story, but we're going to take time to really look at it tonight. Every opportunity to allow despair to grab hold of her, and she refused. It kept coming, and she pushed it away. It kept coming. We wanted to drive and control her, but she was determined that she was going to be in the driver's seat. So we're going to take a look at this uh, story. Now, we all know this story very well. She was the one who created the prophet's chamber. I love when you read this story because the Bible has a need to tell us everything she put in a room. He had a little bed, he had a little table, a little desk, a little lamp. I love the fact that they found a need to tell us how she decorated it for him. <laughs> In other words, it wasn't just a mat on the floor. It was actually a real nice room. She was a wealthy woman, by the way. So she made him a really wealthy, nice room for those times, a great room. And so because she said, you know, he needs a place to stay when he comes into town. And so she made this room. Now, he wanted to do something for her because she did something she opened her house to him. And he said this in 2 Kings 4, if you're following along, verse 14, what is then to be done for her? This is what the prophet asked his servant, Gehazi. Gehazi answered, well, she has no son and her husband is old. <laughs> so he put two and two together. I ain't going to get kids anytime soon. He said, he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. And he said, at this season, about this time next year, you will embrace a son. 
And she said, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your servant. Like it was hope on hope. She couldn't believe it. But the woman conceived and she bore a son about that time, the following spring, as Elijah had said to her. Um, did you ever wish for something so much that you didn't want to dare to hope to believe for it? Because you didn't want to hope for something and then be disappointed. You never want, you didn't want to lay your heart out there and then, oh, if I hope and I don't get it, it'll be worse than if I didn't hope. And this is how this woman felt. She felt, I want a, I want a child so bad, but I don't want to hope for a child. I don't want to hear these words and then it not to come to pass. But hallelujah, it did come to pass. And God gave her what she had longed for all those years. And it says this, and when the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers, and he said to his father, oh, my head, my head. The father said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon, and then he died. Now, I want you to think about this situation. A lot of times we read through these stories, oh, yeah, okay, she said, he, he died. Think, think about the passage of time. From the moment of the distress, the little boy saying, my head, my head, my head. Oh, my gosh. Most of us who have kids, when our kids are sick, it's not, it, you know, we're immediately our alarm goes off, right? So from the moment that he's sick, my head, my head, dragging him in from the field, which I'm sure took time, and him sitting on her lap all day, all day, sitting on her lap, and then finally dying. That must have been a horrible, horrible, wretched day. I mean, here she's thinking, I hope it gets better. I hope it gets better. You know, what's going on here? And think of that long lapse of time. And think about what most of us would have done in the midst of that. Most of us would have just fallen into a puddle of grief. We would have been wailing and crying and weeping, right? Here is that promised son. Here is the one I long for. And now the promise is dead. But this woman refused to be driven by her emotions. She refused to be driven by despair, but she had a different perspective. She was driving her life by faith, by faith. She refused to give in to those emotions. Now listen, although grief and despair were right there laying at her door, trust me, I'm sure she felt every single one of those emotions. But although driving despair was at her door, she was al not allowing those motions, emotions and that perspective to grab hold of her. She was clinging to something else, and that was faith. That was faith. 2 Kings 4.21, and she went up and she laid him, her son who's now dead, on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Now the first thing, this is so good. The first thing she does is she lays him on the prophet's bed. The prophet always represents God, right? Not the king's bed, not the neighbor's bed. The prophet is, because the prophet represents God, especially in the Old Testament. It was the only way they could hear from God was through the prophet. The prophet heard from God, the prophet spoke. And so he was God's representation in the earth, and she laid him up on the bed laid him before the Lord. And this is our first step. And how do we, in the midst of these terrible situations, how do we not allow despair to drive us? Our first step is this. When you feel the initial disappointment, that sense of loss, take that broken promise or dream and lay it before the Lord. Don't let it sit and stew in your arms. Don't hold on to it. Quickly, quickly. As soon as you feel disappointed, say, oh, God, I feel this. This is terrible. Maybe someone said something to you or does something to you. or Maybe you experienced some kind of loss. Don't go into that pit. Just say, God, I don't understand this. I don't get this. I don't get it. I'm just giving this to you. I'm just giving this to you right now. And I give it to you, Lord, right now, right now, before anything else happens. And I'm letting you turn it around. And so I like this. She didn't sit and gaze into death. She didn't lay there, oh, 
She didn't weep and sob over her son. She immediately went into action. She laid him before the Lord, and she didn't gaze into death, but she sought after life. You know, a year before my Catherine was born, I was pregnant. And, um, you know, I was eight weeks along. I didn't realize I was that far along, but I was. I was eight weeks along. Pastor Mark was overseas in India. And at that time, the communication was not good in India. I couldn't get a hold of him very easily and stuff. Anyways, I remember I was <laughs> doing Thursday night service. I was here, Thursday night service. I was preaching. I went into this restroom right here. And all of a sudden, I noticed I had all this bleeding. And I was having trouble that week. I knew that something was up. And so my sister Lauren was here, and I said, Laurie, you need to come home with me because I had Harrison and Victoria at home. And I said, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, um, but you need to come home, you know, with me. So she came home with me, and uh, we called the doctor. He, the doctor said, you know, put your feet up, come in tomorrow, we'll do a sonogram tomorrow, we'll see what's going on. Well, we put, put my feet up, and then, you know, we had watched a show. I don't know. We were just there relaxing, you know, and all that. And then all of a sudden, I stood to my feet, and whatever was inside of me, baby and all, there it went. And then I, I, was, I miscarried at home. And um, I, I had all this residual bleeding and, um, you know, was in the, the restroom for a long period of time. And I, I kept saying to Lauren, I don't know, I sort of feel a little weird. <laughs> I feel a little lightheaded because this bleeding wouldn't stop. I feel a little lightheaded. I feel a little lightheaded. Lauren says, this is ridiculous. We're taking you to the hospital. And so ended up going to the hospital that night, and they did what they don't call it a DNC anymore. They call it a suction thing, a DN suction thing. So they, anyways, they suctioned everything out that was in there. And basically, I had a miscarriage, and the baby was gone. And, um, you know, pastor wasn't here. This was on a Friday. I was back here on a Sunday preaching because I was holding forts, like I always do, hold forts. <laughs> I was holding the fort. But I came in, and I determined, listen, I didn't understand that. I was not going to get angry at God. I wasn't going to get bitter at God. I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't understand all that. Because I believe me, when I was running into trouble, I was speaking the word. I was declaring the word. I was like, you know, in Jesus' name, you know, I, you know, I was praising God. I was doing all that. I, but I was determined that I wasn't going to get mad at God over any of this because he's not my problem. He's not your problem. <laughs> He's your solution. And so I said, Lord, I don't get any of this. And poor Pastor Mark didn't know anything about it. I said, I don't understand any of this, but this one thing I know, two things. I love you, and you love me, and that's all that matters. That I know. Sometimes in the midst of a situation, you need to cling to what you know. Don't allow your brain to what you don't know. Just cling to what you know. And, you know, how good is God? Here was a broken promise. And guess what? Exactly, exactly one year, exactly one year later, Catherine was born. And I always tell, I know, and believe me, she's a, she was an amazing child. God gave us an amazing child in her. She's something else. She will take over the world. <laughs> she will. But um, she's you know, God was faithful to give us and restore to us. But you need to lay some things before God. Sometimes things that happen to us, we don't know why. We're probably, sometimes we won't know why till we get to heaven. Or maybe when we get to heaven, we won't even know then. But we do know that God loves us. We do know that Jesus died on a cross for us. We do know that there isn't any good thing that God is withholding from us. That we know. And we need to cling to what we know. And so it says this, and she called to her husband in verse 22 and said, send, send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. And he said, why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. She said, all is well. Or in some translations, it is well. But in this one, all is well. You know, as much even at that point, here she sat with him all day. She watched him in agony of heart, mind, and soul. I, I don't know what he had. Maybe he had a brain tumor. 
My head, my head, he said. We don't know what was going on. Maybe it was an aneurysm, a brain aneurysm. And he just dies. She watched her son in agony. I mean, you know, he wasn't in a hospital somewhere medicated. He was probably screaming and crying all day. And then he just dies. And here this woman, here's her husband. You think she would have just fallen apart. The husband doesn't even know the son is dead yet. She hasn't told him. She just went and put him up in the prophet's chamber. She wasn't going to let him know. And so as much as all of us, misery, you know, misery loves company, doesn't it? Misery loves to just talk the problem, talk the agony, talk. And they said this, and then that happened, and they did this, and they did that. The second key, when you're in the mist, when agony's trying to lay its goods at your door, this is the second key to not allowing despair to drive you, but you driving it out by faith. The second key is this. As much as you want to vent everything out everywhere, don't allow your mouth to overflow with the disappointments and the agonies of heart and soul. Learn to keep your lips sealed. I know that's hard. I know we're all venters. I'm a venter too. I have to vent. I have to, I have to tell you how I feel. You know, sometimes we have to get our feelings out. Not all the time. We need to learn not to just let all that, oh no, he's dead, he's gone, he's gone, he's gone. And she could have done that, but she refused to. Even how it can be difficult. And listen, if you're standing and believing God, as much as the enemy would love you to speak the problem, don't speak the problem, speak the solution to the problem. But God! If you have to literally, you know, just put the, your hand over your mouth, but God, don't allow that doubt and unbelief to come into and over your life. It says, be still and know, in Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. And the third key, the third key here is don't speak what you see, speak what you don't see. Speak God's word in the reality of the spirit that all is well. It is well. You know, I, I think I, I, I was listening to one of preacher, and he goes, you know, I, you know, the devil comes and says, says to you, what you going to do? What you going to do? You know, he was going through a hard financial time. What are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? And he says, you know, God told me you start telling the devil, what are you going to do? Your end's going to be a pit. Your end's going to be that you're going to be there for a, and for a thousand years and then you're going to go back to a pit. What are you going to do? And he says, you know, what's the worst the devil can do? Kill me? Then I go to heaven. You know, sometimes you, you say, really? What's the worst that's going to happen here? Throw your best shot, devil, because in the end, I'm going to heaven anyways. In the end, I'm coming back with the Lord with ten thousands of saints, and we're coming to defeat all your enemies all your armies, all your demons, we're going to round them up and throw them in a pit. We're going to laugh when we see you. We're going to say, oh, really? You're the one? You're the one that trembled the nations? You're the one? <laughs> Sometimes you just need to laugh in his face when he's trying to torment you with thoughts. Amen? All is well. Second Kings 2 says this, then she saddled the donkey and she said to her servant, urge the animal on. She says, let's go fast. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And when the man of God saw her coming, she said to Gehazi, he said to Gehazi, his servant, look, there's the Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? And she answered, now listen, here were very specific questions. The last question was, is all well with your child? He was dead as a doornail on that bed. He was dead. The quote, facts, was that he was not well. He was dead. But she refused to allow that reality out of her lips she said, even to the point of question, all is well 
Why was all well even when the son was dead? All is well because God still sits on the throne. All is well because God still does miracles. All is well because he can still raise the dead. Even today, all is well. All is well. All is well. And so she said, all is well. And I want you to know, when you read through this, at no point along the way does the text say, my son has died. She never says it out of her lips. Never, 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 never. She never says that my son has passed away. And I think most of us at this point, again, would have totally unloaded on the servant of God, letting out all the emotion and distress of the day, but she doesn't. She doesn't. She still holds the line. She still determined that she's getting a miracle. So in the place of fear and chaos, she is standing in a place of peace because she knows her God is able. So peace says all is well, even when everything is falling apart around us, right? Again, when she gets to the man of God, the man of God represents God himself. She doesn't question him, but she reminds him of what he spoke in the beginning. Remember, she says, I didn't ask for this thing. <laughs> I told you I was afraid to hope. I think it's interesting that we can have peace and faith in our hearts when we have doubts in our minds. Right? Sometimes we go, this is looking really dicey here. You know, my mind is going tilt, tilt. I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know how God's going to turn this around. But you have this supernatural peace. Have you ever experienced that before? You know, you've walked. I don't know how this is going to be reunited. I don't know how this is going to be put back together like Humpty Dumpty fell off that wall. I don't know how the, he's going to put it all together again. But I know I have peace in my heart. I have faith that God will turn it around, even though I don't understand with my mind how he's going to do it. So we can still have that peace and faith, even though doubts are swirling around. It says, when she came to the mountain to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet, and Gehazi came to push her away. And Gehazi was never very perceptive, just saying. <laughs> There's lots more stories about Gehazi. But the man of God said, leave her alone, for she's in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me, and he has not told me. Then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? She cast herself at the feet of the prophet, and the prophet, of course, is God's representative. And she is completely throwing herself into God's hands. He said to Gehazi, tie up your garment, Take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not reply. And lay my staff on the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. Therefore, he returned to meet him and told him, the child has not awakened. Of course, Gehazi had the staff in his hand. A symbol of the power of God was given into his hands. And he sends him forth with a mission, and he was not to be interrupted with that mission. He was to go immediately. He wasn't gonna, supposed to stop and you know, get a drink at the fountain or go talk to people. He immediately was going, immediately going with the power of God in his hand to lay it on the face of the child. And we see that it was of no effect. But this is what I want you to notice. The woman of God doesn't run with the prophet's servant. Interesting. Most people would have run. This is it. We've got our answer. Let's go. Most people in terror, I mean, What's the one thing this woman wants? I want my child to wake up and be normal and whole again. I want him to come back to life. Most of us would have stopped what we were doing and ran with the servant to see if it would work. But she refuses to leave the man of God who represents God. 
And I love this because the prophet in representing God, in essence, this is what she's saying. Regardless of what happens, God, I will not leave you. I will not leave you. And again, with the proper, you know, representing God, we have to learn something. This is our fourth step in walking in faith and not allowing despair to drive us. Don't forfeit the presence of God just to get something out of his hand. Stay in fellowship with God. How many people come seeking God because they have a problem? Because, oh no, oh no, they come back to church, someone's sick, they have cancer, they have whatever, they come back to church, please everybody pray, pray, everybody pray, pray, and then at times, then God will heal them, and then they'll stop coming to church, I don't have to come anymore because I got what I needed. It isn't as precious as that hand was, what was in the hand was the sun rays, as precious as that hand is. We shouldn't always be about seeking his hands. We need to seek, amen, his face, his heart, him. He's the goal. He's the goal. Again, I think some of us, we need to live, Lord, regardless of you answering my prayer, or if you never answer this prayer in this lifetime, I'm still going to serve you and love you. If I don't get the son back from the dead, I'm still going to love and serve you. I still think you are mine and I am yours and there is no one that, and nothing's coming between us. Nothing. I'm telling you, yes, all of us have had disappointments. I don't know why that thing happened. I don't know why we pray for one and they live and we pray for another. Sometimes somebody dies. And we apparently, they apparently spoke the word, did the right things, cried out to God. But in the end, God is still God, and God loves you. In the end, we, you know, regardless of what happens, you need to cling to that relationship with him. We shouldn't just be running when we need something. Coming when, we, you know, oh no, it's that, you know, Oh, has it come to this? We must actually pray. (laughs) Has it come to this? We must actually. We have to have that ongoing relationship with him. We don't want to forfeit the presence of God. So when Elijah came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on the bed. So he went in and he shut the door behind him. I love this because this is sort of a little bit, I love this, a little foreshadowing of Jesus and Jairus' daughter. I love it. I love when God ties things together. Very similar. And Peter, remember Peter? And Dorcas, you know? <laughs> Don't ever name your child. I think that's a dreadful name, by the way. Dorcas. Please. But you know what? Someone's going to name their kid Dorcas. Anyway, someone did in the Bible. Anyway, so. <laughs> but I love this. It's a little bit of a foreshadowing, foreshadowing of Jesus. So he goes in the door and he shuts the door and it's just the two of them. And he's praying to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child. Wow. Putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Woohoo! He's warming up. And I have a word for you. Listen, sometimes you're praying, don't give up don't give up. Your miracle is warming. Sometimes you need to say, hey, I don't care. My miracle's warming. It was cold before, but now it's warm. It's at least warming, right? Then he got up again. He did it again and walked once back and forth in the house, went up. So he went down into the house, walked back and forth, even though the child hadn't raised, but it was just warm up there. <laughs> went up and stretched himself upon him again. And the child sneezed seven times, which is the number of completion. And the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi, and he said, call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she came in, he said, pick up your son. And she came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son, and she went out. An amazing woman of God. Amen? Amen who saw the miracle, even through the midst of disasters, saw it through to the end. 
would not give up. I want you to consider mouth to mouth. In other words, God was infusing in the dead life of the dead boy his life, his breath, his words. Eyes to eyes. He was infusing his perspective into the situation. Hands to hands speak of being empowered by his plan. And I, you know, sometimes we need to pray. We need, we need to pray. Say, God, give me your eyes on this situation. My eyes only see this, but your eyes have a different perspective. Sometimes we need to say, Lord, empower my hands to do your will, to do what you want me to do with your plan. And finally, mouth to mouth, Lord, allow my mouth to speak forth your words of life. Again, don't speak what you see, speak what you don't see. Stop speaking death, but command life back into the situation. Now listen, I want you to consider the length of time that the circumstances and the facts that were working, the quote facts, the apparent facts. Remember the, the Bible said we always talk about there were the facts, but then there's the truth of the word of God, right? Here's the length of time. Here's a timeline of a miracle. Son is sick with the headache all day. He dies four hours. She lays him on the bed and has the horse saddled. An hour, I'm guessing at some of this. Travels to the man of God, two to three hours. Conversation with Gehazi and Elijah, an hour. Time for Gehazi to lay his staff on the child. Again, back all the way to the house, two to three hours. Elijah returning to the house, an additional hour. Time for Elijah to heal the boy. And I don't know how long it took him, but he laid on that boy for a while, and we know he did it at least twice. So we're going to say at least an hour. The total time for the miracle was 10 to 12 hours. At no point along the way did she lose it by falling apart. At no point along the way did she just give up or cry out and say, I can't take it anymore. I knew this would happen. I knew this would happen. I knew if I got my hopes up that my dream would be stolen. At no point along the way. At no point. She held the line. She persisted. She walked in faith the entire time. And the fifth principle is this. She received her promise anew. A broken promise, a dead promise was made whole again. Now, this woman's name uh, was never mentioned. We don't know her name. She was the Shunammite. <laughs> you know, it's so funny because it reminds me of my great aunt, my grandmother, they always referred people to their ethnicity. Ethnicity. Oh, those are Germans. The Germans. The Germans. And eh, just a little tidbit. So my great aunt, Geraldine, my great aunt Jerry lived in Dormont. Pastor Mark grew up in Dormont. My great aunt used to teach piano lessons. And when I was a kid, my, gra my great aunt would tell me how, oh, I'm giving le lessons to a German boy. And he comes with his brother to the lesson. The older boy brings him to the lesson, and I'm teaching the younger boy the piano. Now, this is when I was, what, maybe 11 or 12, pretty young, maybe younger than that. I don't know how, I don't know. But guess who the two German boys were? The two German boys were Pastor Mark and his brother, Scott. Scott took piano lessons. Don't you love how God does things? God, Scott took piano lessons off of my great aunt long before I ever met him when I got older, as a, you know, in, in my late teens and early 20s, I let, met Pastor Mark. In fact, when I would be visiting over at their house, Diane had a, a player piano in her front room, and in her, you know, as most of us always did, remember the piano bench and the benches would all open and all your piano books were held in the bench. I pulled out a piano bench, and there was my great aunt's handwriting in the book. I love how God, listen, God does things amazing, amen, amazing. But listen, we don't ever know her name. She's just called Shunammite, but she comes from the town of Shunem. That word Shunem means two resting, two resting places. This woman 
was given a child, but she received the child twice. She received him once, and then, of course, when he was revived again from death, she received him again. Remember? He says, come and get your child, and she receives her child. Two resting places. She received what seemingly was lost and all hopeless, yet there still was God. Amen? But God. So two resting places. She was at rest for the first promise because the prophet said, you will have a son. And she was at rest for the second promise because she knew that God would raise the promise again. Amen? Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Don't cast your trust in the Lord away because of a circumstance. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. Hebrews 12, 2 and 3 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Consider Jesus. He suffered so that we would not have to suffer. And bringing us back to this original scripture, we are experiencing trouble on every side, 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9. But we are not crushed. We are perplexed. But we are not driven to despair. We are persecuted. But we are not abandoned. Listen, don't allow the devil to tell you you're all alone. You are not abandoned. We are knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Always carrying around in our body the death of Christ so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our own body. Amen? Amen. Listen, we don't have to be driven by despair. We don't have to give up, even though it's tough. I understand. Listen, many of us, many of you here, we all can tell horror stories, right? We can all say, you know, this was dreadful. I didn't, you know, I lost this person or I lost this job or these people did me wrong and it was, it was wrong. It wasn't right. It's okay. Listen, the enemy can throw all he can at you, but God, amen? Allow God, like we said this morning, those circumstances that seemingly are hard, allow God to take the roots of them and burn them for you. Lay them at the altar so that he's able to turn around those things for your good. Amen? We're going to pray. And then I'd like to kind of powwow with everyone. If you don't mind, if we all come up here and just talk a little bit together, okay? Um, but we're going to pray first, okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we are thankful and grateful for your spirit. And I pray right now, if, you, if you're going through a hard place, just, you know, you don't have to stand up, but just lift your hand if you're going through a difficult season, a hard place, maybe something that you just don't get right now. You just don't get it. Okay, I see, see all those hands. Lord, in the name of Jesus, right now, we lift these situations before you. Lord, we're asking you to turn these situations around Lord, that which is dead, we ask you to infuse with life. That which is seemingly broken or lost, bring it to us again. I speak peace on this household and these individuals. I speak peace, double peace, Lord. The first peace, a resting place, the first promise. But Lord, the second promise, let it come afresh and anew. Lord, you and only you, can change these circumstances. Lord, remove any sense of disappointment. If you're dealing with disappointment, put your hand on your heart. God, heal, heal that sense of disappointment. Heal that sense of hopelessness and despair. Lord, even though it looks terrible and dreadful, Lord, we have confidence in you. Lord, we may not understand everything we go through as individual, but these things we know 
we love you and you love us and that's all that matters. It's all that matters. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.